Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our more spring seminar series. And uh, today is, great, is my great honor to have a uh, speaker, Professor Arjuna Madanayaki to join us and uh, give a very exciting talk on a very exciting topic. And uh, let me uh, just introduce uh, to Professor Arjuna Madanayaki briefly. He's an associate professor of ECE uh, department at the Florida International University in Miami. He received uh, his PhD degree in double E from the University of Calgary in Canada in 2008, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering from the University of Maratua, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka in 2002. Dr. Madanayaki's uh, research interests include antenna array processing, phase array, multi-dimensional signal processing, digital filter design, light field signal processing, computer architecture, digital VLSI and FPGA systems, software-defined radio, millimeter wave and 5G, 6G communications, and radar signal processing, full duplex uh, simultaneous transmission and receive for MIMO, computer arithmetic, digital arithmetic circuits, blockchain-based spectrum management, machine learning for RF systems, intelligent circuits, analog computing, which is a topic today, as well as mixed signal electronics and the digital AI accelerators for advanced autonomy. As you can see, Adrian had a very wide uh, spectrum of interest. And uh, I, I always enjoyed his talk in the past from the conference, uh, from, from I enjoyed discussions. Uh, that's why I invited uh, Adriana to join us today. I think uh, um, before that, uh, uh, let me talk about the logistics first. So, let me, so if you have some questions, please raise your hand in the, in the chat window. And uh, I will be act be on behalf of the speakers to, to, to provide opportunities to, for you to ask questions. And during the talk, please uh, mute yourself, mute your uh, microphone. And uh, this uh, talk is recorded as, as you were. I think uh, now floor is yours, Adrian, please. Well, um, first of all, great honor to, to be uh, speaking to you today, to panel. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Rui, for having me, much appreciated. So my talk is, um, is basically covering our DARPA project uh, on analog uh, computing. Uh, it's a phase two now we're at the very last you know, couple of months. So I'll be covering several of the chips that we've uh, looked at and we'll go into detail in one to one system. Um, so it's more of an academic uh, kind of you know research sponsored by uh, DARPA Defense Science Office. Uh, so, so we've explored going back to analog for doing certain special classes of computational problems. Um, so let me let me get started. I'm going to basically turn my video off for now. Okay. So the project is uh, actually a lot of people are working on it. Uh, several PhD students, collaborators, and uh, people from industry. So first of all, I just wanted to acknowledge their contribution and say that, you know, without the teamwork from many people, uh, it is uh, very difficult to do this kind of project. So thank you to everyone in the team. So I will begin by a very short background on analog computing, where all this is coming from, uh, in, a, in a very brief sense, and then give you an overview of some of the stuff that I talk about. In particular, we'll be looking at the computation of partial differential equations or PDEs uh, in a spatio-temporal computational grid using analog techniques. So the favorite example, uh, at least for today, would be uh, finite difference time domain in analog for, for doing simple computational electromagnetics problems uh, dealing with Maxwell's equations. I'll also talk a little bit about some other types of PDEs, especially nonlinear PDEs, uh, for exploring things like gas dynamics. So the circuits part of it, uh, we'll go through the math, some of the algorithms, and then I'll talk in detail about 
the various approaches that are present for mapping these mathematical operations into CMOS uh, chips. Give you some results. We'll also talk about a little bit, um, not, not, not a lot of detail, but uh, a little bit about analog computing in the discrete time domain. At the end of the talk. This down. One second, please. Moving the zoom bar. There we go. So, so analog computers are actually nothing new. Um, the first computers that that were invented before ENIAC and the digital revolution uh, was actually analog. So during World War II, there were really huge analog computers, first mechanical analog computers, and eventually vacuum tube based analog computers uh, used for a lot of military targeting kind of applications. So in the naval destroyers, for example, uh, long range cannons and other weapons were targeted using a completely analog computing technique. But after invention of ENIAC and then the Moore's law, uh, you know, digital computers uh, became the dominant technology and people kind of forgot about analog computing. But analog technologies have also undergone the kind of growth that digital has. So these days there are transistors that work at, at hundreds of gigahertz, as you very well know, right? So the question that, that the Department of Defense is asking is that, can we exploit some of these high frequency modern CMOS and other analog processors to do computations in an efficient way to help accelerate some of the challenging problems uh, that, uh, that uh, the scientific community is facing? Having trouble with Okay. So these days, analog computers are getting a lot of attention in AI and machine learning as well. So we've all heard about the interest in computing memory, for example. Uh, there are companies like Mythic that's uh, commercialized analog computing techniques where they basically use flash technologies uh, to, to create matrix vector multipliers in analog. So that's very exciting. Uh, then there are other companies and other approaches for machine learning and AI on analog techniques, like, uh, for example, spiking neural networks. So, so those things are, you know, uh, being explored by a lot of people. But our project, at least at the moment, uh, is a little, little different. We are looking at classical analog computing for solving mathematically hard, uh, computationally intense, uh, physics-based simulation problems. So essentially our objective for our project would be to use analog accelerators to speed up very difficult physics simulations. I think the ultimate goal was to actually accelerate the simulation of nuclear fusion in the Stokamax and Stellarators because it's very complicated. The plasma and fusion equations are very complicated. It takes months to simulate. So the idea is, can we accelerate that uh, by, you know, using some analog benchtop technique to get the simulations to work in a couple of hours? So that's the motivation. But of course, our research is much more basic. We are at a much more elementary level. We are looking at far simpler things uh, at the moment. But anyway. Am I going the wrong way? Yes, I think so. All right, here we go. So very quickly, uh, just to give you a snapshot of what's happening. Uh, on the top left, there is a, a big analog computing uh, system. Uh, it's called Brain Scales 1. Uh, I think that's a neuromorphic uh, analog computing scheme uh, used uh, for neuromorphic computing. On the right, there's this uh, analog thing that people in Europe are trying to commercialize. It's a fairly simple analog computer at the board at, at, at the desktop level, you manually wire, wire, wire things uh, using cables like a big breadboard, and you can do simple analog computing on that. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, on, the, on the bottom right, there's Mythic, very famous company now, uh, trying to do analog computing memory using flash techniques uh, for machine learning. And on the left bottom, um, this is a very nice chip from Columbia University by Professor Yanis and Mingu and others. 
uh, working on uh, basically energy efficient analog uh, approximation of uh, the equations. So lots of people are looking at various aspects uh, of these analog computing techniques. So our contribution is, uh, is an extension. I think the closest work to what we are doing is actually uh, the work done at Columbia by Professor Sidis uh, in the past. So we are basically trying to use high frequency analog chips uh, to, to get a speed up on computing partial differential equation based classical physics. So the computations are completely continuous time uh, and analog valued all based on uh, usual transistor dynamics. There's no quantum uh, behavior utilized here. And the objective is to map a computationally difficult physics problem into a corresponding analog circuit and then let the analog circuit operate in real time to get an approximate solution to the, to the physics problem. So, so we've looked at different classes of physics problems. Uh, in particular, we have done simple finite difference time domain type algorithms for uh, Maxwell's equations. That's the most promising result that we have. And then we are also looking at nonlinear partial differential equation systems uh, like uh, acoustic uh, shockwave tube problems. We have chips for that. I'll talk about it. The analog computer that we are looking at is an integrated circuit. It's a massively parallel systolic array in analog. So inside your analog chip, there, are, there is a grid of parallel processing cores. Usually the spatio-temporal nature of the physics problems mean that you are solving the set of partial differential equations in a space and time grid. So the spatial grid is discretized. So you have discrete values in space, uh, each handled by its own parallel processing analog processor, like a subprocessor. But each of these subprocessors operate in continuous time. So your computational grid is discrete in space and time continuous. So by doing that, you can map these smoothly varying time continuous functions with their partial differential operators directly into circuits using uh, re resistors and capacitors and other, uh, other components. So your analog computer is implementing your partial differential equation system in analog, but the partial differential system equation system needs boundary conditions and initial conditions. So these initial and boundary conditions themselves are waveforms, high bandwidth waveforms. So at the edges of the computational grid, you have to feed those things uh, using some sort of uh, digital to analog conversion scheme uh, to excite the computation. So the computation occurs in analog and it produces high frequency waveforms, which you have to sample back using ADCs back into the digital domain for the next level of processing. So we have this setup where we have, actually we are using Xilinx RFSOCs, which have uh, quite a few high speed ADCs and DACs on them. So we are using the RFSOCs to provide the boundary conditions and also measure the outputs. So this is the overall architecture of the system. So I'll get into the meat of it. Um, let me first talk about our chip that's uh, designed to compute Maxwell's equations. So we've simplified the general case of Maxwell's equations into just one spatial variable in this particular case, but we have investigated two algorithms for implementing the Maxwell's equations in one spatial and time variable. So the first technique we call a continuous time Laplace or CTDL method. I'll explain how that comes about. So here we are not discretizing time, we are keeping time continuous and we are using Laplace transform to map the map, to map the Maxwell's equations directly into resistor capacitor values. So that's the first approach. The second approach is called the all pass delay approximation or APDA method. Here, what we are doing is we are actually taking a standard finite difference time domain algorithm uh, known as the Y algorithm. It uses a staggered grid of uh, uh, spatial grid, spatio-temporal grid, 
where you know one set of grid points correspond to electric field the other set of grid points correspond to magnetic field and the grids are uh, offset by half a half a clock cycle so by doing that you can actually compute uh, like a leapfrog leapfrog te technique you can compute the electric and magnetic fields uh, in a time stepped spatial grid so what we are doing is we are taking the standard algorithm and replacing the discrete time that's uh, used in computational flows with a continuous time analog delay. So when you do that, what you get is an analog circuit that can implement finest different time domain. So we've done that. Uh, so out of the, t the two different algorithms that I'm uh, showing here, the first one is limited to linear PDs because we are using Laplace transform. Now, the general case of PDEs is nonlinear. So the second technique is actually applicable to nonlinear PDEs as well. So we believe that actually the second technique is the more promising technique. And uh, I will go into more details about that in the talk. So very brief review of Maxwell's equations. I'm sure uh, many people have seen this. So I'm not going to go through the Maxwell's equations. But in general, we are showing that we can uh, simplify this um, single spatial variable, single time uh, variable Maxwell's equation pair and show uh, that the solution of the wave equation is indicative of solution, uh, solving uh, the Maxwell's equations uh, problems. So our technique uh, is basically, uh, it begins by taking equation four, which is the continuous time, continuous space, uh, PDE for the wave equation. And as a step one, we discretize the spatial domain while leaving the continuous time uh, intact. So that is unlike all the other techniques in, in the literature where we discretize time and space both. We are not discretizing time. We let leave time be, but we discretize space using a second order uh, operator. So when you do that, you get this equation five, right? It's discrete in space, but time continuous. And you can do that uh, because we haven't uh, discretized time. Now, I won't go through the math details here, but we can take a Laplace transform along the time direction. And immediately your time variable T becomes Laplace variable S with some initial conditions and things like that. So with a little bit of algebra, what you can do is you can get this equation eight, which is like a differential operator. You are computing the output at one special place location based on the values of neighbors, but it's also got a Laplace component to it. So what that means is not only are you just taking a linear combination of the neighboring values, you also have to send that result through an LC network or some other passive, uh, some LRC network that will impose a spatiotemporal uh, behavior to it. So equation eight is a mixed domain equation. It's, it's a differential, differential operator along space, but it's a Laplace operator along, along time. It's like a filter. It's a multi-input single output filter. So conceptually, this is what the single processing core looks like. Now, there are dedicated processing cores like this for every spatial point in your computational grid. Okay, But every computational grid will have a linear combi combination circuit along with a, along with a Laplace a transfer function. So we have an inductance and a capacitance. And by choosing the values of the inductance and capacitance, we can change the parameter of the uh, of the solver. So, so when we implement this, we don't have to we don't have to build an inductor, for example. That's not necessary. This is only a, only a, a idealization of of the concept of the of the system. The practical realization will use only RC active circuits. There are no inductors in, in here. So you can wire up such processors into a grid and you can connect the inputs and outputs across neighbors. So remember each processor is analog, it's got a LRC function and it's active circuit that it implements one special location of the computation, but you can connect them up into a grid with feedback so that the uh, Maxwell's equations can be realized in continuous time. So I've kind of indicated that. So X axis is, is discrete but the, y, the, the other axis is time, it's continuous. So we have a set of lines like waveforms which indicate how the solution 
of the system evolves as a function of time when you keep exciting the input using uh, a boundary condition, set of boundary conditions, which are also analog waveforms. So that's the first approach. The second approach, uh, as I mentioned, is we discretize both spatial and time dimensions. So that is uh, no different from uh, textbook finite difference time domain. But after you have done that, you have your discrete time variable, which we now go ahead and express as a continuous time delay. So we've taken, we've taken the discrete time delays of some, some duration corresponding to a sample system. And we've converted that into a non-sampled analog system by replacing the delay with the all-pass filter. So the all-pass filter ideally would have unit magnitude and uh, constant group delay. So we, it turns out that we can build these all-pass filters very nicely at high frequency on chip. Sorry, I saw uh, there is a question from Saleh. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so just want to make sure I understood. Um, so basically in the first method, um, yes. you are uh, using finite difference for a space, but yes. Laplace for time, right? That's the... Exactly. So it exactly implements the Maxwell's equations a long time. Okay. So one question, maybe you already have figured out in the papers, but what about the, so when you do something like that, what, so one of the things that we do, for example, for um, final difference is that using Taylor expansion, we can also talk about the convergence rate and the guarantees um, of the convergence rate. Yes. Can you do the same kind of analysis for this? Uh, yes, so, papers, yeah. yeah, I think we've looked at that. I'm, I'm sure it's in the paper. So so in, in the first one, we discretize, uh, discretize the, the spatial. So the, there is a degree of oversampling needed for that. If you, if you don't oversample it by the right amount, then uh, this convergence will not occur. But for the for the time dimension, I think there is no issue because we are using the PDE directly. There is no approximation for the first method. Um, for the second one, both spatial and temporal dimensions are discretized. So for achieving the convergence, like in the finite difference time domain literature, there are certain bounds that you have to satisfy. So so we said we 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 made sure that those uh, degrees of oversampling and things like that are met. Otherwise, it uh, it gets unstable. And, and uh, okay, thank you for that. But sure. um, also, if you want to, so here you used um, finite difference, uh, yes. but I imagine you can do uh, finite yeah. element or yeah. finite volume as well for this space, right? I mean, th that should not be. You uh, can for the linear case. I don't know whether you can do it for nonlinear problems. Oh, okay. So for at least for linear case, you know you can do finite volume, finite element. But yeah, so we have another that's... algorithm where okay. we actually find the Fourier transform along space. I see. Okay. And and uh, keep time constant, and that's a mixed domain technique. We we looked at that, but we haven't made a chip for it. So the, because I of see. that, we I am not talking about that today. But okay. yeah, you're right. All right. Okay. So basically, at least for linear. It does. I mean, you can play with a lot of a spatial um, uh, discretization, but for nonlinear, at least at this point, it's not clear to you how exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, from, from what we've learned in the literature for PDE solving, which is very extensive, is that nonlinear systems are basically done in the time domain. Nice. Uh, okay. Thank you. But, you know, I, I'm not an expert at that, but that's my understanding. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you. So, so again, so now we are trying to. In the second method, we are discretizing the time domain also. And everywhere we have a time delay, we are replacing by first the Laplace version, where the time delay is re replaced by e to the minus s tau, standard time delay, right? And then it turns out that there is a finite order uh, polynomial approximation of e to the minus s tau uh, using a third order uh, all pass filter. So, so we've done quite a bit of work on that in the past to on how to build wideband delays in analog. Um, and this phi s that I shown here is actually an all pass filter on the, on the chip. So it turns out that 
we can approximate to a very good good uh, uh, level this e to the minus st which is not realizable exactly using a cascade of first order all pass filters usually three first order all pass filters back to back is good enough to get a pretty decent uh, approximation to a wide band delay so we are actually building the all pass filter as an approximation as a cascade of three first order all pass filters if i remember correct so we went ahead and built the circuit so a little bit about uh, comparison so we wanted to see how close we could get uh, to a software based solution using finite difference time domain and uh, and our analog technique so what we did was we we decided on the time delay that was needed and we implemented the simulations in code and in analog using the same parameter so all of the simulations that i talk about whether it is fpga based c++ based cuda or gpu based or analog all have the same values of time delay and we defined some metrics uh, about you know how precise uh, how close the answers are going to be against the software reference and the analog uh we defined some you know things like matrix like signal to noise ratio mean squared error things like that uh, just to come to some measurement of how how well it works so then we also simulated some standard simple uh like baselines uh, radiation boundary condition neumann boundary condition and dirichlet boundary condition uh, for single spatial variable and continuous time and we kind of you know tweak the circuit so that we get within a reasonable level of course the analog has noise and other problems so you will never get to an exact solution but you could make it uh, pretty decent depending on how much error you can tolerate in the final application but uh, generally speaking we could tweak the cadence uh, circuit so that at least under simulation it was it was good so this is the top level diagram of the linear finite difference time domain solver using the second technique where we are replacing the delays with all pass filters so again we have a massively parallel analog systolic array where all the inputs are analog all the outputs are analog and there is a interconnection between near, nearest neighbors uh, that guarantees a high degree of parallelism uh, between the in the structure so it's like a systolic array but except that it's not systolic in the sense it's not digital there is no drum beat or clock that synchronizes all the processes it's a fully analog system so every spatial processing core corresponds to one pixel in the simulation in the in the model so we designed it in uh, 180 nanometer cmos uh, it's a pretty old process uh, 20 25 years old but we chose that because it's a one very very cheap and also we can afford to make mistakes and new make new chips so of course the performance that we get here is not the best that analog can give uh, if we go to a modern analog process like you know 65 or maybe 28 or 22 uh, things will be much better we think but we define uh, but we define the problem for 0.18 and we assume that the input waveforms have 50 megahertz of bandwidth the circuits themselves correspond to a finite difference time domain delay of 1.6 nanoseconds uh, and um, the individual processes are built out of uh, very high bandwidth op amps uh, on chip having gain bandwidth product of about uh, 600 megahertz a little bit more than, more than that so a quick look at the all pass filter just for interest so this is the circuit of the all pass filter it implements e to the minus s to as an approximation of a cascade of a number of first order sections and everything is implemented on chip using rc active high bandwidth circuits this is how the all pass filter behaves so you can actually change the gain uh, on the all pass filter from unity to gain, uh, sorry the db values going from minus 4 to plus 2 and you can see the group delay on the on the on the right so all of the circuits are actually tunable because calibration is very very important for analog computing and everything has to be calibrated it's a very significant problem so we found out very quickly that unless you make all of the building blocks tunable and you have a closed loop calibration scheme in the circuit uh, nothing works 
So calibration requires tunability in all the blocks. So this is one internal module, the block diagram for one spatial point. So it's a multi-input, uh, multi-output, uh, MIMO circuit uh, in analog, each processor, right? It's got multiple neighboring sections feeding inputs, and it produces a bunch of outputs which have to be connected to all the other identical neighbors. So it's like a, uh, it's like a, you know, a, like, just like a systolic system, but it's analog. And it's got closed loop control inside each module with all pass filters in the feedback loop all of which are tunable. So we had to do some tricks to make sure that extra delays and phase shifts that these circuits add have to be compensated. So the calibration of all the delays that make up the final output had to be done very carefully. And we ended up having some automated algorithms to do that. So this is the full circuit diagram of one single uh, spatial point. Um, and there are copies of this circuit for every spatial point in the processor. So, uh, you know, some details about OTA based feedback loops and how these all pass filters are tuned. There are buffers to isolate different sections and all of these transition circuits are uh, pretty high bandwidth, like more than 600 megahertz of bandwidth. Also, I wanted to say that the tunable capacitors that you see here and the tunable resistors are actually circuits with multiple digital control bits. So you have like uh, on-chip capacitors, capacitive DACs that can be programmed using a serial waveform, sorry, serial stream. And you can tune every single resistor capacitor on every module independently. And finding the right solutions for uh, getting all those values tuned properly was a daunting task, but uh, the students have managed to do it using uh, some optimization scheme. But there are lots of knobs to tune. Otherwise, uh, the calibration does not work. So this is the first uh, chip, the, the micrograph of the chip. So it produces a finite difference time domain computation uh, with the equivalent bandwidth of 600 megahertz. But the real time bandwidth of the signal that it can process is 30 megahertz, which is actually quite a lot. So it can process 30 megahertz RF waveforms uh, while consuming 200 milliwatts of power. So requires quite a bit of calibration. Um, it this kind of small, it's a proof of concept. So it, it does a computation over 16 parallel processors in analog, so 16 spatial grids. So scaling to larger, larger systems would be, uh, would lead to higher power consumption and of course, uh, bigger chips. So we published this in the Journal of Solid State Circuits uh, last year. So this is how the setup looks. On the left, you can see the board with the analog computing chip. I've shown it on the left-hand side as a close-up. So the chips in the middle, the little uh, black square is the actual analog chip. All the other wires on the board are actually equal phase uh, transmission lines, 50 ohm lines. Uh, which are used to excite this computation and get the results out. So to interface this into an actual software programmable digital system requires quite a bit of work. So in this case, we were using this Roach 2 board. Uh, that's a standard issue in Radio Astro. So if you look at some of the larger radio astronomy correlators used in a square kilometer array or the SETI Institute, for example, in uh, California, they have these big correlators using this uh, open source board called the Roach 2. Uh, and it's got a very powerful, you know, Vertex 6 uh, FPGA on it. And it can support high bandwidth A to D and D to A over lots of channels. So we use that with some, you know, COTS components to interface the analog computer to the actual uh, digital part so that we can excite the thing using RF waveforms and see what comes out. So that whole th whole system was interfaced to another Linux computer using uh, high-speed Ethernet. So these are the measurements. These are coming from the actual chip. So I won't go through the, de the details of it, but we, we excited the chip using standard uh, simulation waveforms. We captured the output that the chip was producing, and we compared that against what MATLAB was producing and we quantified the error margin for each type of simulation on the chip. 
So we are getting very good speed up. I'll talk about speed up later, but uh, of course it comes at a price. So MATLAB is pretty much exact, but the measured error in the, in the model is as good as 1% in some cases, but as bad as 10% in other cases. Why, why is that? Is that, do you have some analysis on where you normally have the high error? I, yes, I think the short answer is yes, but I don't have it with me right now. So mm -hmm. I, I, if, if you're interested, I can look at, look at the DARPA report and I'm sure it's there somewhere. Uh, but I, I don't remember at the moment, but we do have it. So, so here, is the, here is the speed up uh, against different technologies. So our objective is to accelerate in real time a 30 megahertz waveform. So in the analog computer to simulate one millisecond, it takes exactly one millisecond because it's, it's real time. But for other technologies, for example, uh, if you implement the same simulation using the same time difference, uh, delta T in finite difference time domain in uh, NVIDIA GeForce uh, you know, GPU, for example, running uh, operating on CUDA, it takes 420 milliseconds to do the same simulation. For one, for one, simulate one millisecond, it takes 420 milliseconds on the NVIDIA. Now, we found that if we had a high-end Linux server uh, with 256 GB of RAM, it actually is faster than the NVIDIA GPU. It was about 100 milliseconds uh, in MATLAB. And if you wrote it in C, uh, it was 26 milliseconds. So that is the software, software comparison. So we found that the analog computer is actually 420 times faster than the uh, GPU, at least for this model. And uh, on average, about 100 times faster than MATLAB on the high-end server and 25 times, 26 times faster uh, on C for the same server, same parameters across, across the simulation. So then we wanted to see, okay, how does it compare with a modern digital chip? So what we did was we took the fastest FPGA we had at the time, that was the Xilinx RFSOC, and we implemented the same algorithm, uh, identical parameters in every sense, uh, same number of uh, you know, spatial locations, uh, same uh, clocks, uh, clock to you know, other parameter ratio, everything the same. And we found that, of course, the Xilinx RFSOC is very fast, so the analog computer is on average about 2.8 times faster than the state-of-the-art Xilinx RFSOC. Uh, so that's still pretty good. And remember, this is a 25-year-old CMOS process. So the hope is that if we implement it using 22 nanometer or something that's more suitable for high-speed analog, we'll get better results. So now uh, I'll talk a little bit about our next project. So the first chip, which I uh, talked about right now, and we got pretty good results, uh, is for linear PDs, right? So we use, use the Maxwell's equations model for that. So as part of the second project that we did at FIU, we wanted to extend the simulation into nonlinear PDs. So, so we came up with this uh, toy problem where we have an acoustic shockwave tube where you have some nonlinear PD behavior. So the solver, it's a, it's a you know, conservative system uh, known as conservative system in physics. There are nonlinear operators uh, called the flux term and the source term. And there is a nonlinear difference equation that relates different spatial points across spatial and time dimension. So it's quite a bit of math there. Uh, we are using uh, as a starting point, the solver known as uh, McCormack scheme. But we implement the MacCormack scheme for this nonlinear PD using uh, analog in continuous time. So again, in the MacCormack scheme, there are finite time delays. We replace the finite time delays using analog high-speed all-pass filters. So this is how the circuit per pixel looks like, per, per processor. So spatially discrete time continuous, or SDC, uh, TC equations, in nonlinear mode, so there are nonlinear blocks that model the flux and the source terms. Uh, there are several variables that you have to keep track of. And to cut a long story short, we implement the whole nonlinear solving scheme, uh, lots of terms. It's a very complicated circuit in continuous time in analog. 
So one module actually looks like this, and there are 15 modules. So here, the op-amps are used to create the individual control systems. There are uh, variable capacitors shown here. Each of these variable capacitors actually coming from a capacitive DAC. So there's a lots of programmability um, in each module, and there are multiple modules, all independent. So getting everything properly lined up uh, and calibrated was very difficult. Uh, so we have got some success on that, uh, but it could have been better. So I'll, I'll talk about it soon. So let's look at the complexity of this. So this is the actual nonlinear solver chip that we have just finished testing. So there are 15 spatial grids and every grid uh, has analog processor. So this processor also, um, this chip internally has 450 RF op amps, 450 all wired together in one, one, one single spatiotemporal nonlinear feedback circuit. So getting that stable and biased properly uh, was uh, very challenging, but we have got some success with that. Uh, so, so we have this analog chip and then we use the Xilinx RF SOC this time uh, to provide the boundary conditions for this acoustic uh, shock wave tube problem and the RF SOC also to get the outputs. Chip operates at 1.8 volts, uh, again, 180 nanometer CMOS. So unfortunately, when we were laying out the chip, uh, we made a little mistake in one place. We forgot to put one beer. So only half the simulation grid was working but uh, we have results for that half of the simulation grid. So to kind of summarize, uh, we have continuous time analog uh, high bandwidth computation. It's a compromise between power efficiency, uh, accuracy, uh, and you know the pain you need to go through to get it to work. So, you know, I mean, it's a scientific pro research. So we've kind of had to go through our learning curve for this. But we've learned that for certain types of models, for example, like um, the finite difference time domain solver for linear PDEs, it works very, very well. But the more nonlinear and more difficult the solution, the more sensitive it is to various numerical errors and things like that. So it becomes uh, exponentially more difficult to do nonlinear solutions. To talk about some other stuff that we did for the same project, now we also went and created a analog solver using discrete time using switched capacitor circuits. Now this work was done uh, through my collaborator at the uh, University of Florida. So he was the lead on that. Very quickly, uh, again, Maxwell's equation solution in analog, but this time it is no longer time continuous. It is discrete time uh, implemented as a switched capacitors and switched current uh, type of circuit. So here we got much better accuracy, but of course now it is uh, run by a switched capacitor clock. So everything is slowed down by a large fraction. So it's not very fast. So some circuit uh, details of that, we know you have a whole bunch of uh, op amps which are connected with switch capacitor sections, uh, polyphase non-overlapping clocks to make sure everything uh, occurs at the right time. This paper was also published in uh, General of Solid State Circuits as a different paper. So here's the setup for that. So again, this is the discrete time version, uh, 180 nanometer CMOS chip. Uh, we used some new types of Sigma Delta ADCs to improve the SNR. Uh, of course, this chip works very nicely, but it is quite a bit slower compared to our first chip, which was fully, fully uh, time continuous at RF. Some measurement results uh, to show that the chip works. Uh, I'm not really going to go through details of that. So this is just a chip uh, photograph of the four chips that we built as part of our DARPA project. So on the left, we have our nonlinear PDE solver uh, in the middle, uh, the discrete time uh, PDE solver. And on the right-hand side, we actually had to do two chips for the finite difference time domain. Um, so uh, some of those chips are shown there. All right, so in conclusion, uh, analog computing was uh, on chip was was explored for accelerating scientific computing problems uh, defined by nonlinear and linear partial differential equation systems. 
we got mixed results for some types of problems. For example, the linear problems, we got excellent speed up. But for nonlinear systems, we found that it was exponentially more difficult to actually make the systems work. So we got only partially working, uh, partially acceptable results, which we haven't published yet. But uh, we learned a lot of valuable lessons on how an analog computer actually behaves, how sensitive, where, where are the sensitivities for bias voltages, uh, how much error can you expect from a nonlinear solver when you have quantization in the weights uh, that you are implementing, uh, how sensitive would it be for errors in the time delays, how sensitive it is to gain, how sensitive it is to the power supply voltage, all of those things were thoroughly explored and we got a very good understanding of how some of these most uh, more complicated nonlinear analog solvers behave. So we are at the, we are at the, you know, uh, at the end of the project. So our main takeaway is that, yes, analog computing can be used for for you know, accelerating certain types of uh, scientific problems, especially simpler problems dealing with basic physics, which are hopefully linear, and you want to get a solution that is much, much faster than what GPUs or FPGAs can give at a much lower power consumption. So basically edge computing type of applications, uh, where the problems are not too complicated, but power consumption and speed are of paramount importance, then analog computing is probably okay. Uh, more difficult to get it to work for extremely complicated physics problems, uh, which require a lot of precision and uh, that kind of uh, behavior. So, so again, uh, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to solve all of computing problem, uh, computational needs, but it's one of the many tools that's available to, in the toolbox to meet the demands of the future. So quick view of the publications that came out of it. We got uh, several transactions on uh, circuits and systems papers and two papers in uh, general of solid state circuits. Some more conference papers. Wanted to thank DARPA's Defense Sciences Office uh, and uh, the original program manager was Dr. Vincent Tang who funded us, so thank you. Uh, thank you to OSHIS Technologies, which is the prime sponsor for this STTR award. I uh, want to thank Rui uh, and uh, Mel for having me give the talk. And also thank you to my second PhD student who is currently in the group uh, for, for all her help and all her work on the slides. Thank you so much. So thank Rui, uh, I'm ready for questions. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, sure. for, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your first-hand uh, direct experience in this emerging area. We know sure. that you know, computing, as you said, is, is not new, but uh, Recently, it does uh, pop up again to especially applied for machine learning applications. Yes. Here is a very scientific fundamental uh, uh, adventure that you shared. But so I saw that we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Sally, okay. you want to go ahead? Okay, thanks uh, for the talk. Maybe my first question was a little bit on the uh, on the numerical side, on the convergence rate and everything. Uh, yes. But my second question is about okay so uh, there are when it comes to pd we know we cannot talk about the generic uh, one uh, one tool fits all the problems kind of thing right. uh, there are a couple of uh, solvers that here we uh, open source ones at least i can mention like open foam finite volume based uh, or phoenix uh, which is with it, which has a python interface but uh, it's also written in c++ finite element based so they are heavily validated for a spectrum of problems uh, from, from narrow stokes and fluid mechanics to electromagnetic especially phoenix uh, and also they are very scalable in terms of the number of cpus that can run using open mpi in parallel so I think one of the directions of this research, the, your, your research would be good if you can mount such solvers. I understand that you mentioned that uh, it would be tricky for finite volume, finite element, but it would be very interesting to mount these uh, open source solvers into a hardware system like the one that you discovered. Do you think that, what, what do you think about uh, a future of such implementation? Uh, what are the, what, what do you I think? I mean, I, I think that's very interesting. Uh, 
definitely the, the issue that we faced with this particular example was scalability. So, so we are using one pixel, one solver per pixel, essentially one voxel. So, so we can at best do a couple of hundred uh, solutions or voxels at a time, but you have to somehow reuse that processor multiple times to do a large simulation like the ones that you talk of in the software frame. So, so scalability and how would, would be an issue when we are trying to uh, trying to you know use that let's say the analog accelerator as a processor for some of these frameworks. Is that what you had in mind? Maybe. Um, but definitely, like I, I I don't think we are ready to compare the solvers that we are talking about in analog with the kinds of stuff that you mentioned because. The, the, the solution domains that we tried out are so tiny. Uh, they are basically experimental, you know, circuit, little circuits that do a tiny part of a very large grid, right? So is it really comparable to something like an Avia Stokes on, on software server? Probably not at the moment, but, you know, going from this to that is such a large step. I'm not exactly sure what, what would be the next step to go there or whether you can go there. Um, but definitely, you know, it should be, it can be integrated at some level, but when that should occur, whether it is the next step, I'm, I'm not sure. You, you see, I mean, my, my, my problem is that the circuits that we tried are very tiny. I mean, their spatial grids are 15, 16 uh, spatial locations, but the solvers that are in the open source community used by serious computational solver, you know, people are very, very large. So, so how do you go from this to that? It, it's not a one step hop to go from the kinds of problems that we are trying out to those kind of problems. Um, yeah, I, I understand. Yes. I just want to see your perspective on it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, if audience have questions, feel free to raise your hand or directly ask the speaker. Uh, I do also want to get your opinions on the economic side. I mean, the digital uh, chips has been very successful because you can produce uh, produce in massive uh, at low cost productions, right? But the, yeah. the analog solution, as you as you just pointed out, is is basically targeting a quite a niche market. I mean, how what, how can we make this thing successful? Uh, from an uh, economic perspective, is, is any any comments, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think the, the the economic scaling that comes with digital will also apply to to this. Like, I mean, the the examples that we shown here are actually not products, right? I mean, these are uh, essentially experiments. But remember, we were doing one eighty nanometer seam, so that is very low cost compared to other things. I mean, I, I think even TSMC is now now uh, retiring that process. If I'm if I'm right. not mistaken, uh, so but if you take the next one, let's say ninety or one thirty, we are still good and that's pretty cheap. So if you can find an application where it's warranted, I don't think uh, it has any disadvantage compared to digital as such. Um, what would be more exciting, I guess, would be to see for price for price, millimeter for millimeter. If you mm -hmm. go for a more modern process, what can what more benefit can you get? Like if this circuit was implemented in twenty two or twelve nanometer or something like that, right. uh, uh, not 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 something that's twenty five years old, then perhaps it would be even you know better for edge computing. Um, so like this mythic chip, mythic chips, these are economically viable, obviously because they have a they have a business there. So. But can that product also solving quite a range of application, not only for a specific one application, the chip you mentioned? Yes, I mean, it's basically a matrix vector multiplier. So it, it can do linear algebra, which is great. Uh, but I don't think, or it's not obvious to me how a linear algebra core can do something like uh, the, the, the physics models we are talking about. So that is good for, the big market in AI and machine learning, that's fine. Uh, but these chips are kind of a different um, different domain. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I really don't know much about the economics of it other than that, but 
there's no reason why it's non viable as such. Um, okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, right. Also talking about the frequency, right? The solution you propose here is basically based on RF CMOS technologies, and it certainly has speed and bandwidth limitations. Yeah. I also saw some 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 universities, some research organizations was proposing solving PDEs, solving Maxwell equations using optical technology, optical process, right? Okay. Uh, 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 I think it was a group maybe from from Open. Uh, I forgot the name, but uh, I think. Do you think uh, your your solutions, your your arithmetic uh, equations can also be scaled up in terms of frequency? Let's see if you have a viable optical indium phosphide, whatever technology, right? Can can really replace CMOS in terms of speed and bandwidth. Uh, how how do you see that part? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be very exciting. I mean, the only reason why we went with 180 nanometer CMOS is because that's what we could afford for that kind of project in the mm -hmm. university. Uh, but definitely, uh, things that are, um, you know, these other more advanced technology nodes with optical components inbuilt uh, would be far, far better in terms of performance, uh, especially if you can do it for applications which don't require very highly precise PDE solution. Uh, like AI and machine learning would be the obvious example. Um, so things are looking very promising for that for analog. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I see we have a questions from from the audience. Uh, Shrestha, you you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, thank uh, thank you, Professor Madanaike, for for the wonderful talk. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Please. Uh, so. First, uh, since since it's an analog chip and it has uh, multiple uh, resistors, capacitors that are uh, that, as you said, are being optimized and calibrated off chip. Uh, yeah. How does the chip? Perform? No, 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 not off chip, not off chip. It's not off chip. So, sorry, I can, let me clarify. So, so the resistors and the capacitors are all tunable electron electrically. So on the chip itself, there are DACs with a serial bit stream, like you can, like a like a long snake of registers that you can send in a couple of thousand bits of control information, and those DACs set control values that make the resistors and capacitors tune. So that calibration step is all on chip. Yeah. So uh, my my question is basically uh, first: is is this uh, calibration one time or uh, does it run in the background? Um, it's not one time in the sense that if you switch the thing off and come back next week, you have to do it again. Okay. But, but for a particular experiment, like when we fire it up, sometimes we work it, we make it work for a couple of days. So, you know, for that kind of period, it is stable. Basically once per warm up. let's put it that way. Okay. And uh, how long does it take uh, for this calibration to happen? It depends on the algorithm of we are using. So we have different uh, algorithms we have tried. The amount of combinations in the control bits is so large, you can't do, ex you can't do uh, ex exhaustive uh, uh, calibration. So you have to find something like a method of steeper descent. It's not a method of steeper descent, but some you know way to come to the optimum in a more reduced number of steps. So so we have some uh, some algorithm that we came up with that for that, but it takes about I think uh, half an hour something like that. That that seems pretty fast. Another question. So since it's an analog chip, it it must have some uh, some limitations because of the process uh, and uh, temperature and voltage variations. So and and I see it has a large number of resistors, capacitors, op amps. Yeah. So uh, so how does it perform uh, across the the PVT uh, variations? So it, it it depends on which problem we are trying to solve. So for the first one, for the linear Maxwell's equation solver, uh, the worst case error we got was ten percent. But sometimes, depending on the situation and the location we are looking at, we got better than 1%. So roughly, uh, I would say uh, equivalent precision of about 7 to 8 bits in a, in a digital computing scheme, but of course, much faster and lower power. And it wasn't any worse than that. Now, the nonlinear uh, solver was much more uh, difficult uh, animal. So 
So we had a lot of trouble with that. And in fact, after getting the chip fabricated and, and, and bound, wire bound, it took like nine months just to get it to work, just to get the calibration and all the other things reasonably okay. So depending on the mathematical model that you are solving, uh, for very nonlinear solutions, solution schemes, it becomes horrendously uh, more sensitive, much more difficult, uh, to the point of impracticability, impracticability sometimes. Uh, so, so it really depends on on the model. Uh, it's a function of the model. Uh, and and uh, one more question is: uh, so you said that the ADCs and the DACs are being used for from from FPGA. Uh, so how much uh, offset would it create if, if we were to bring it on chip completely in terms uh, of area and power? Um, I don't know um, because, you know, the, the reason that we have the ADCs and DACs is only for test and measurement. Now, if you embed the processor in some sort of edge computing application, for example, you are going to look at a radio frequency solver of something that's coming through a MIMO antenna scheme. And you want to model what's happening in a little enclosure, for example, let's say take a typical example. And, and you want to predict something that before it happens very fast. So then your receivers would directly wire the IQ waveforms at let's say 30 megahertz bandwidth into your processor and everything would happen in analog. And the final output will also probably go to one or two DACs. Uh, ADCs. So, so the practical realization of the circuit uh, is not the same as the test and measurement setup that we, we have now. Uh, all those big FPGAs and the ADCs that we have sticking out are, are a result of a need for very precise measurement of what's happening. So, so it's a little difficult to say, uh, Shrestha. So, um, we just chose the most precise, most well calibrated ADCs and DACs that we could find. And that's coming from the radio astronomy community, right? So it comes with the price of power consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, just to remind people, uh, we scheduled one hour and uh, this is the over uh, discussions. If you have some other meetings, feel free to, to depart. And uh, otherwise, uh, if people who wants to hang out here and uh, ask uh, other questions with the professors we, and to talk about other topics feel free to to stay here and uh, we can we can chat a little bit more few minutes more uh, uh, professor arjuna i want to i mean we saw a lot of analog compute comp, uh, computations coming back is basically targeting ai applications I, in my view a lot of applica applications uh, was basically solved to competing with cpus to to bring the in memory computing to, to break the memory wall and power wall to yeah. enable application on the edge, right? That was yeah. a big trend here. But yeah. your, you kind of take a little bit uh, another path of right. pursuing this, this, uh, this uh, 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 research topics. So, but the, what, what is your view on applying analog computing for AI applications for the edge applications? Because we see a lot of market potentials there, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very promising, actually. So, I mean, I, I don't know much about the in-memory computing aspects uh, people are talking about, but in general, like, if we were at supposed to... Level, yes, I, I think at high level, there is innovations on the, on the material level, right? On the transistor level, on the memory levels, yeah, uh, on the architecture levels, of course. But... Uh, but, uh, but that seems to be a lot of research opportunities there too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I mean, even if we take an old process like 180 and just make matrix vector multipliers or convolutional engines or transformers or something like that in analog, mm -hmm. actually, when it comes to circuit design, that is orders of magnitude easier than trying to solve a nonlinear PD uh, because matrix vector multipliers, in fact, are very simple operations. True. So, so I think uh, I think there's a lot of potential uh, in analog, including neuromorphic uh, and other approaches, which are not necessarily in-memory computing. Uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that in-memory computing is very interesting, but that's not the only approach for analog computing for AI. There are so many other things that's that you right. can do. 
That's correct. Uh, Neuromorphic, uh, certainly, as you mentioned, Inter and I think other IBMs have been working on that uh, recently. Yes. Uh, even with with, uh, with a commercial chip available. Right, right. So, I mean, we are trying to do some of that. So now the future, we are trying to go uh, a little bit in a different direction. We are trying to do radio frequency machine learning in analog. Mm -hmm. So for 6G and other, you know, next generation future G systems where our baseband where bandwidths can be 10 or 20 gigahertz. Uh, you are not going to do that on a GPU. So, mm -hmm. uh, so can we come up with very fast analog uh, radio machine learning systems, RFML, as that can look for modulation recognition and things like that in analog. Right. Yeah. But but end of the day, you still need a A to D to D to A converter to inter uh, to interface with the digital world, right? But how, how that part can be resolved? So I mean, I mean, let's say you are doing an inference. So uh, your decision rate is usually much more slower than the input IQ sample rate. I mean, to, yes. to, to give you a simple example, let's say you are going to do modulation recognition and you want to have a logic high when you detect uh, uh, 64 qua. Mm -hmm. It's a random example. So, so your input stream might have 10 gigahertz of bandwidth, mm -hmm. but your modulations might change every, you know, every nanosecond or every, every 10 microseconds. Mm -hmm. So your actual ADC rate that's looking at the decisions are much slower than the input rate. So it, I, I think that's fine. That's right. You do not need to make a decision for each samples, right? No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> so. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Shrasta, I saw your, your hand is still raised. Do you have other follow-up questions or? No, no. That, that is fine. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're welcome to contact me over email or anything uh, if you have any more questions. Yeah. Mm. yeah I, I saw you also have a... Uh, um, what is called a star applications, right? Simultaneous transmission and uh, receiving. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so we are we are actually we found a very simple solution to extending wideband, inband, full black, full duplex to multiple antenna case. Hmm. So, I mean, usually when we think about full duplex, you think about circulators, and there's lots of work on that. Yes. But but let's say even if you have a perfect circulator, completely ideal behavior, wideband. Uh, infinite, uh, you know, isolation among ports, the, the full deal, a perfect one, okay? Yeah. The, the moment you have multiple antennas, the transmit signal from one antenna goes full blast into the receivers of the other ones. So circulators are not going to help you for MIMO. So that problem of inter-antenna coupling in MIMO is very difficult. And in fact, DARPA has an entire program just for two antenna case. Mm -hmm. So, so we have a simple solution based on symmetry. Uh, we, I mean, I can send you the paper on that. We are at least for the base station side, we can uh, actually solve that problem uh, using simple techniques. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not, it's not viable at low frequencies from the handheld, but on the base station side, you you can you can get a nice result. So, so we are trying to extend that. Yeah, it's also in general. I mean, resolution is also part of analog computation, analog means of, of solving problems. And it's actually RF, so it's implemented in the microwave domain. Right. Um, but it's, yeah, it's analog. You can think of it yeah. as an analog solution. Right, right. So that's very, very nice because I saw a lot of 6Gs that's become one of the enabling technologies, right? Because of frac uh, frequency spectrum limitations, the, the full duplexing, in my view, is, is one of the uh, key technologies for 6G to, to be used. Right. Our yeah. solution basically operates by having a second copy of the antennas in a shielded box. So all of the mutual couplings from every antenna to every other antenna is replicated in the, in the one in the box. But you have, you have one antenna array shining out towards the actual source and the mm -hmm. other one in the box. And when you subtract one from the other, you can exactly remove all of the interference among all antennas. Uh, so it gets more practical for higher frequencies. So, uh, you know, I mean, at 28 or higher frequencies, this little box is smaller than an iPhone, iPhone case. Yes. So it's not that much of a big deal. Yeah, uh, it's more about thermal management. <laughs> right. Yeah. For that to, to worry. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Uh, any more questions from the audience? 
otherwise, I think we can always, uh, I know how to reach out to you yeah. and to, to follow up if other questions come up. Thank you so much for having me, Ruby. I really enjoyed it.